introduction. So I welcome you to our panel on strategies for a new industrial age, substitution, recycling, and a circular economy. My name is Martin Sturmer. I work for the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas, uh, where I do research on non-renewable resources and commodity markets. And I also brief our president on energy markets in particular. So what happened today with OPEC is something I'm highly concerned about. Um, I used to work for the German government in a, and exactly for the sort of institution that Dennis has asked for here in the US. It's a federal agency on resources and they are a bridge between firms on the one hand side and the federal government on the other side. Um, and then I wrote my PhD thesis on the long run development of metal markets and now I work for the Federal Reserve. Let me start with a little bit of my family history in introducing you to our, our topic. So my, my father, after the Second World War, he made his first money by collecting power cables and other copper scrap and then delivering that to the copper smelter where my grandfather used to work. And that copper smelter, smelter was basically feed or fed from, from, uh, from, from scrap metals and still is actually. And um, then my father became a mining engineer, but even today, he's now in his late 60s, um, if he sees a, an old power cable somewhere while he's going for a walk, he can't resist to pick it up <laughs> and uh, <laughs> deliver it to one of these smelters. So uh, the question of our panel here is, uh, in base metals, we have a relatively high uh, percentage share of recycled materials but we don't see that that much in these rare metals. And we wanna find out why, are, why is this? Uh, what can be done to kind of increase the share of recycled materials? But we're also gonna see if there are other strategies to um, kind of increase the security of supply of these materials. Um, we have ver four very distinguished speakers, and I'm very lucky to have that. And I wanna first start with Steve Conlin. He's president of ICD Alloys and Metals. And your company is really focused on recycling and the trade of tantalum, hafnium, and other rare metals. Yes. So what can we learn from your company about recycling? Mm -hmm. What's the economics behind recycling in comparison to to sourcing these materials from mines. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we are grateful okay. for your introductory well, remarks. Th th at this thank point. you for having me, uh, Martin. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, you know, pleasure to be in front of everybody. It's been a long day, so we'll finish off the uh, the panel today, I think. But uh, ICD, we are a recycling company, uh, handling all nickel, cobalt, super alloys. Uh, in all of those nickel and super alloys are rhenium, hafnium, uh, and tantalum. Uh, our job is to basically capture those metals outside of the alloys that they're actually involved with. So they go into a super alloy turbine uh, engine. Um, basically, it will be remelted. Uh, for product that can't be remelted, we have to capture the rhenium, hafnium, and tantalum. So uh, the way we do that uh, is a chemical process, uh, also just a straightforward recycling process. So we would like uh, blast material, we would take coatings from material, we would size material. Uh, so that it's ready for a furnace, uh, directly for remelting. Anything that can't be remelted uh, would then, what we would deem scrap basically, would go on the scrap heap. Uh, so I'll talk about rhenium first. Uh, very strategic metal, more than a, uh, a rare metal. Uh, I would say uh, it's uh, a dislocated metal right now in the fact that it's needed more than what is actually produced. It is a byproduct. Uh, it comes out of copper. And, uh, you know, very nervous, sorry about that. <laughs> it comes out of copper, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> give me a second. Happens to me all the time. Yeah, <laughs> sorry about that, I'm not, this is the first time public speaking, I'm sorry about that. Uh, you know, an annually on rhenium, there is 40 to 50 metric tons uh, generated per year. The current demand is around 70 metric tons. So, you know, there's an offset right there. So it's important to capture every single piece that we can of rhenium. Now, where it's very, very uh, strategic is the fact that um, 
China is coming on scene uh, making uh, super alloy engines and they are going to need more and more rhenium. So if the world is already in need of more than what is actually produced, it will be you know, a, a strategic metal then in the future and it could become a problem. We don't know yet uh, as far as the volume of rhenium that's going to be needed. So I think it's going to be uh, uh, one to watch on price right now. It's very depressed and unattractive to people right now. Uh, Rhenium. Rhenium's pricing maybe two years ago was over, or maybe several years ago was over $4,000 a kilo. And uh, it is now down to around $1,700 a kilo. Mm -hmm. So there's a big displacement there in price. It's very unattractive for people right now. If the demand grows, there will be a shortage of metal. And therefore, you know, we should see some growth in uh, Chinese price, well, in rhenium prices because of China. So uh, we'll see how that, we have to watch that one ourselves. But Capturing it uh, is very difficult because it's uh, geographic locations of all of the scrap. It's around the world. It's Singapore. It's uh, Korea. It's Japan. It's Europe. Uh, collecting that all into one area is very difficult. So uh, that is a challenge. But companies like ours, we do actually go out there. We'll source material from all around the world, bring it into one location, and then treat it and resell the product back in. Mm -hmm. So companies like GE, Pratt & Whitney, they've done a very, very good job over the number of years. Uh, in capturing and recycling the units. If not, you know, the largest consumer of rhenium is super alloy. If GE and Pratt didn't take the actions that they did several years ago, uh, the supply and demand on rhenium would have been a problem. So, you know, once the uh, rhenium's taken out of a product, you then have a, another byproduct coming out of that, which is tantalum. So we also handle tantalum. Uh, we, uh, we extract the tantalum from a tantalum tungsten which comes out of the rhenium mm -hmm. and we re recycle that and make a tantalum synthetic concentrate. So uh, uh, the tantalum synthetic concentrate that we, uh, that we handle uh, is safe. Uh, there's non-conflict from mining from Africa or anything like that. So we don't have to have, have compliance with uh, EICC uh, or, or have a conflict mineral approval or license or anything because it's all generated from the scrap waste. Uh, again, the world is reliant on China for hafnium again, uh, for uh, tantalum, uh, and uh, it will be a uh, it will be uh, an increasing uh, well, there'll be an increasing demand that, that that's going forward uh, as super alloy grows. So uh, we have to watch the uh, the tantalum as well. We have to recycle that uh, coming out of the nickel-based alloy. Uh, the next one that we handle is uh, hafnium. So hafnium uh, about two years ago, I received a phone call somebody offering me a very, very small amount of hafnium. Uh, and when he told me the price, I almost fell off my chair. It was ridiculously <laughs> uh, priced. The price had quadrupled overnight, uh, and I wasn't sure why. So uh, I did a little investigation and research myself, and the guy was right. You know, the demand for hafnium all of a sudden overnight had just gone crazy. Uh, so uh, I believe that was a, a consequence of, uh, of the unfortunate uh, nuclear spill in Japan. Uh, the zirconium was on the back burner a little bit. Hafnium comes from zirconium as a byproduct. Uh, and basically, uh, the, the, there wasn't enough hafnium being produced. There was also then an uptake in super alloy production and need for hafnium. And uh, you know, there, was a will, there was very much a will shortage. Uh, the price has quadrupled. Now, recycling hafnium is one that we are looking at. Uh, but presently, uh, there are no methods to recycle hafnium out of uh, nickel-based super alloy. So if there's any, uh, any project engineers out there looking to do something, that's, uh, that's one certainly that, uh, that there's a project you know, for a PhD guy or something. So, but uh, as far as that, we, we, we capture all the <coughs> units and uh, you know, we, we do our best to put them back into, uh, into cycle. So. Okay, thank okay. you so much for this well perspective from the, from the private sector. Yep. The next speaker is Ian Monroe. He's our, our scholar and visiting and, and our lecturer here at the School of Earth Thi Science uh, at Stanford University. Um, but he's also president of Eto Capital and the CEO of Oroeco. These are two firms that invest are into sustainable development. So for example, um, uh, Eto Capital issues the first broad-based, diversified, socially responsible, and fossil-free exchange-traded fund. Um, so, from your perspective, what's, what, what's, the, what's a circular economy? How would 
are the rare metal markets benefit from, from this concept of a circular economy? Um, and how, what are the business models um, that could lead to such a circular economy? Yeah, thanks, Martin. And really great to be here with all of you. Uh, I, I'll, following your lead, Martin, I'll give you a really brief kind of intro to how I got into this and ended, ended up here at Stanford also running a few companies with this weird academic plus tech guy plus uh, now finance guy hat. So I teach courses here at Stanford focused on scaling up solutions to climate change from the technology and policy side. And a big piece of that is looking at life cycle assessment science, which essentially is getting into circular economy, trying to sort out what are the quantitative and in some cases qualitative impacts of technology and policy decisions that we make. And I am here actually partially because of uh, being a casualty of the weird geopolitics around rare earths. I was at Stanford for undergrad and grad school, went on to do international development, renewable energy, climate and supply chain sustainability work in about 30 different countries around North America, Asia, Africa, Latin America. I was for a time living and working in China, primarily in Beijing with Natural Resources Defense Council, looking at supply chain sustainability for the apparel industry. And really interested in sticking around in China to both do a joint MBA between Tsinghua University in Beijing and MIT, and also do a Fulbright at the same time that was gonna be focused on life cycle sustainability of electric vehicles versus biofuels. And I made it through the US Fulbright Committee <laughs> and was all ready and gung-ho to do my project, but the, the host country always has to sign off on a Fulbright application, and they have the leeway to reject it if it gets into politically sensitive areas. They never tell you exactly why they rejected it, but this was 2010. Rare earths all of a sudden were all over the news, <laughs> and as far as everybody I talked to, the most likely reason that I ultimately got rejected from doing the Fulbright, which then meant I ended up coming back to Stanford and got an invitation to start creating courses here and teaching here and founded companies at the same time doing that. So it's all worked out, but basically rare earth political sensitivities are what brought me back to Stanford. So I'm a casualty of that. Uh, my foot is also a casualty of the dance floor about a week and a half ago. I'm uh, one of the younger guys here, but apparently not as young as I used to be, but happy to talk about that offline. So anyway, that's how I ended up here and how my foot ended up looking like this. And in terms of rare earth sustainability, how it fits into circular economy, really the same principles around sustainability that we've been talking about for decades uh, apply to rare earths and optimizing sustainability and their use. So the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle. So on the first R, reduce, it's all about efficiency. And we've talked about this a little bit already, um, and this has been partially driven by the weird geopolitics around rare earth metals. There's been this big drive out of necessity towards efficiency because of the, the price volatility. And so we've seen Siemens, uh, I think, reduce, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, more than 70% the amount of some rare earths that are going into their neodymium Demia mag magnets now. And there's targets to even get that to 100% reduction. And then there's really exciting magnets uh, possibilities with 3D printing now to do customized magnetic fields that potentially wouldn't require rare earth elements at all, or at least would require them in much smaller concentrations than we're using now. And just for a perspective of you know how important rare earth elements are in the clean tech economy, which is something I focus on a lot, electric vehicles, solar and wind power, your average wind turbine uh, can have about a ton of neodymium in it per megawatt of generation capacity. So that's, that's a fair amount, particularly considering how small the production quantities are of rares relative to say iron. Uh, a typical electric vehicle, uh, well, again, motor compositions are changing now, but a typical electric vehicle motor uh, could have something more along the lines of 230 to 250 grams of rare earth. Um, 
And in some cases, you may have four electric motors in an electric vehicle, one driving each wheel. So rare earths certainly are a key piece of our information technology and our clean technology economy. Um, being more efficient in how we use them is a big piece of being more sustainable. And then another big piece of that is, you know, again, reduce, reduce, reuse, recycle. On the reduce side, it's about efficiency. Reuse, uh, there's not a whole lot of talk about that in terms of repurposing components basically for the same purpose in an upgraded design. On the recycling side, we have made some great strides. And the more we can recycle, the more we cut out all the upstream impacts from mining, which includes, as has been talked about briefly already, the fact that unfortunately, rare earths tend to occur with radioactive elements and have a whole lot of radioactive waste associated with their mining. Um, and then there's just all the chemicals uh, in the process as well that can be disposed of, and often is the case, disposed of pretty irresponsibly. Irresponsi Although regulations certainly are improving around that, it's also about you know, how much those regulations are enforced. Um, and then the final phase, which I'll, I'll dive into <coughs> if you're interested in more detail later, because I, I don't want to take away from the rest of the panel here, is going beyond reducing, reusing, and recycling to how is that best supported by policy, and then how is that also best supported by the markets in terms of investor demand and consumer demand, and using information technology to really incentivize supply chains to continuously be getting more efficient and more sustainable in terms of the impacts. And that, that is something that I think there's, there's a whole lot of possibility um, but I'll save that for later and, and pass the torch for now. Okay, thank you, Ian. Um, our next speaker is Toro Okabe. He's professor at the Institute of Industrial Science at Tokyo University, and he's one of the leading experts um, in the world on recycling and processing of rare earth metals. Um, so from your perspective, um, why is it useful to recycle these uh, um, high-tech products, um, especially from an environmental perspective, and uh, what are the challenges to recycling these materials? Why don't we see uh, uh, more recycling when it comes to rare earth metals? Uh, before starting uh, uh, replying uh, your question, let me uh, introduce myself because uh, my resume here is something strange. Uh, uh, about uh, 25 years ago, uh, uh, I was a PhD course student at uh, Kyoto University. And uh, at that time, I was working on titanium and rare earths refining and uh, smelting. So as you can easily imagine that uh, 25 years ago, working on the rare metals processing, everybody speak ill of my research subject. But uh, I was working uh, continuously on those kinds of uh, strange subjects for many years. And uh, about uh, 20 years ago, uh, after spending three years at MIT as a postdoc, I returned to Japan. And as you know, Japan is a heavy manufacturer and user of the rare earth magnet. So I started work on the extraction of neodymium, rare earth, out of the neodymium iron boron magnet without generating any toxic solution. But uh, you can easily also, also imagine that the 20 years ago working on the rare earth recycling, everybody, including my colleagues, speak ill of my research subject because everybody can easily understand that uh, buying a rare earth from China is much cheaper, way cheaper than uh, recycling. But uh, as I know that uh, what they say, as already you know, the mining and the smeltings of ores uh, in many cases uh, uh, induces uh, uh, environmental destruction, especially for the rare earths. When uh, extracting uh, rare earths out of the ore, uh, it generates uranium, thorium, and uh, when uh, using uh, Ion, ion clay in the southern part of China, uh, rehabilitation takes a huge cost. So considering the, the what they say, production process of the rare earth, I 
I convinced that uh, recycling is uh, one of the most important research subjects as a metallurgist and also material scientist. But uh, nobody agreed my what they say opinion that uh, what they say uh, it was uh, oh, oh, multiple years before the, the Chinese embargo. But uh, I was working on those kind of thing, and uh, oh, when uh, what they say extracting uh, going back to the, your questions uh, when uh, extracting uh, rare metals from the recycled materials or recycled uh, scraps. Uh, harmful waste generated from uh, natural ore processing, such as uranium, thorium, uh, can be avoided. And uh, this is the uh, uh, primary advantage of the recycled use of uh, rare metal resources. So but the problem is at the cost, especially in Japan. Uh, what they say, even though the technology developed, uh, recycling cost is way high compared to the processing cost of the natural ore. Simply because, for example, ore is uh, what they say, um, taken almost free cost. And also the smelting cost and the refining cost oh, is uh, what they say, uh, get become very cheap when the, they handle the huge amount of ore. And also, especially in China, the waste management or waste treatment cost is uh, almost zero because they didn't they don't even dig out of the hole they just dump it, it on the on the land because uh, what they say nobody uh, care about the environmental what they say uh, issues so uh, we have to change the mind that uh, how the environmental preservation is important uh, otherwise Recycling, especially for rare earth, will not be what they say uh, practically available in terms of considering the uh, cost. So uh, it's, it's uh, my dream that uh, in the future that uh, people set the same environmental regulation all over the world, and uh, well, if they everybody become, uh, what they say, acceptable for paying uh, environmental cost, I think uh, recycling will be a uh, more pr practical, what they say, way. That is my reply. Okay, thank you, Toro. So the last speaker is David Abraham. He's author of The Elements of Power. Um, so you have dived deeply into the world of rare metals. Um, so what have you learned about the roles of both government, but also the private sector in ensuring the long-term supply of materials. Uh, um, one of the measures, namely recycling, Toro just described some of the challenges. What can firms and government do about it? Before, before, before I get there, um, I don't know, oh, okay, great. Uh, before, before I get there, I, I just wanna make a, a little distinction. I think what, um, what Steve was saying, what ICD does, is uh, recycling, but it's a different type of recycling than we think. Um, for, the, for the most part, um, I don't have aircraft engines. Um, I don't think most of you have aircraft engines. So it's not the, re the, the, the recycling, when we think of recycling, we just finish this can or we finish this. Um, there's re recycling coming from post-manufacturing or um, industrial products. And then there's the recycling, um, as in we're recycling this television. And uh, we, we kind of r run into numerous obstacles. Um, what uh, what uh, Steve does is very difficult, and his products don't travel around the world um, to the extent like these televisions do. So if it's difficult to collect the jet engine, imagine how it is it to collect um, enough amounts of televisions to create an, um, an ore body, if you will, so that you can then effectively recycle it. So there are a number of real challenges um, that, that, that w we see um, s starting, uh, and this is, we can talk a little bit about the government fits in here, but in terms of post-consumer recycling, is that people want, they just, they just don't recycle. Um, if you ask a person, or if you, I could ask people here, how many cell phones, how many mobile phones, smartphones do they have in their house, the answers are gonna be, they're gonna have a couple. So we're, in a sense, we're, we're locking up all of this, this ore in our houses um, because we're not recycling them. And then when we finally do recycle them, um, someone's got to, if you, if you look at that 
television, where, where, how do, where's the Indian? Where's the, the nugget of, of, of uh, europium that's in there? The problem is, is that these things are not made to be uh, recycled. And with the number of screws and glues and getting the, the thing apart just so we can get one component where it's supposed to be is such a challenge and raises the cost. So things aren't necessarily made um, to be recycled. And third, uh, recycling is, is really, really hard. <coughs> Uh, where if you finally get the component to a recycler, uh, they can only extract a few materials because there's the limits of, of one, economics, and two, of, of physics, of what you can what possibly get out. So I think in terms of the roles of, of, of government, um, it's working on ways in terms of just recycling and not, not, not reuse, is uh, how, do we, how do we speed those three functions along? How do we get people to actually recycle the products um, how do we get, how can we incentivize um, the making of products so that they're easier to, re to, re to recycle? Um, and then what investment can be in R&D to help facilitate the recovery of more, more, more materials? Thank you so much. Um, we now leave it open to, to you, the audience. Um, if you have any questions or other comments on that topic, yeah, go ahead. My name is André Gauthier from uh, Matamac Energy. Uh, we work in the railroad space since uh, 2007 and we face many things. We work with Toyota for fi four five years uh, on our deposit in uh, Quebec. Uh, my, my question is for the recycling. Uh, we've I think the recycling face many many things. One is, uh, is the penetration of new product. Uh, for example, is the, uh, in the phosphor industry, the penetration of the lead was so fast that Solvay in, the, in the La Rochelle, in France, build the uh, uh, recycling, recycling plant in, in 2012 and announced uh, earlier this, this year they will, they will, uh, they will stop the, pro the recycling because the lead consume just uh, uh, as, for example, the fluorescent consume grams of rare earth and the formula is the same for the lead, but it's microgram. It's uh, changed completely the uh, phosphor industry for the rare earth and for the recycling, uh, do you, s do you see something can be bad for the recycling, for new technology can be, can be uh, on the market and penetrate the market as fast as the, as the lead for the for the force for? Who wants to, to respond to that? Do you see? I don't have an answer for that. No? <laughs> Toro, maybe? It's very difficult to reply uh, answers, but uh, but I'm working on the recycling uh, many years. But uh, most cases, except for gold or precious metals or some other what they say massive or uh, what they say uh, metals, uh, recycling is costly compared to the ore processing. So many companies just declare that, that they do recycling just for their CSR or something like that. So please do not believe the, the whether it is real, real action or profitable actions. Sometimes they, make th they just use money. Is that fair? How, how much higher would the price have to be to make recycling cost competitive? Uh, depending on the country and also the commodities and the elements, but I I especially in Japan, when the, what they say, uh, collecting cost is way high. Yeah. And also in Japan, when we process it uh, to do recycling, we generate uh, some amount of waste. Of course, it doesn't include any radioactive element or so, but even though those waste treatment cost is very high. So doing the everything outside uh, what they say countries with a low environmental regulation is way cheaper. That is the situation. And, and I think that brings up an important point that recycling is not a panacea either. Recycling itself often can be quite polluting, um, particularly when you're taking a lot of recycling and sending it to a country with lax environmental regulations. So it 
there's very little enforcement of all the effluents that come out of the recycling process. And that it makes it really important to look at the full life cycle of the options that you're comparing in terms of taking from raw ore versus doing a uh, recycling process. Typically, when you look at a life cycle assessment of different rare earth elements, the heavier ones have a higher footprint in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, associated radioactive waste, and other environmental, social, and health concern issues. Um, but of course, you can't easily replace a, a heavy rare earth with a lighter rare earth necessarily in a chemical process. So that, that knowledge doesn't necessarily get you that far, but for whatever rare earth you're looking at, you really do want to look at the full life cycle impacts of recycling versus the, the raw material extraction. And I, I'd be curious actually in your research, given that you've been working on it so long, do you have, for, for greenhouse gas emissions, for example, do you have a number that you toss out there that this is X percentage better relative to uh, a process where you're just taking the mines raw material? Yeah, in general, the greenhouse emission or energy consumption is way uh, low. Mm. Uh, when so ninety percent less or more? Uh, depending like on the, the on the again the materials, but uh, what they say in general, because uh, uh, for example in Japan there exists uh, multiple uh, copper or lead smelters. Uh, when we inject the recycled uh, scrap into those uh, what they say the copper smelters, it or precious metal or copper or lead are easily collected. Uh, with uh, fairly low energy consumption. So if those kind of, uh, what I say, uh, so-called additional process pre-existing, uh, recycling works. But again, the collecting cost uh, of the scraps is uh, high in Japan, so uh, we have uh, another difficulties. Okay, let's open it for further questions. Um, yes? So just a, a quick question, this is John Thompson. Um, to m as far as I'm aware, the most efficiently recycled element in North America, at least, is lead-acid batteries, and uh, which are, could be viewed as simple in some ways, but all have also have their own complexities. And I was just wondering if any of you have views on what we've learned from that and to what extent we can apply the thinking that, that went into the regulation and the thinking and the marketing of recycling lead-acid batteries in terms of other products. Who wants to take this question? I, I, I don't feel like I know enough about the, the development well of that, but do, do you have any hmm? insights you can share about it yourself? Maybe Toro, do you know? Actually, as lead? for the lead, uh, it's uh, one, of the e one of the most easiest material to be recycled. And uh, also, again, lead itself has a toxicity, so that uh, it's easy to develop uh, social systems for collecting uh, the recycled scrap. But uh, in Japan, something strange happened because uh, even though we have uh, also very good uh, recycling system as for the lead acid batteries, uh, majority, major, po big portion of the lead acid scrap is uh, exported to, what they say, Korea or some other countries because uh, they buy, they pay much higher, what they say, uh, fee for the, for for the scrap. Those kind of things also happen. And, and I will bring up a, relative, a relatively interesting related example from the battery energy, energy industry, which is there was actually a lot of talk about rare earth element scarcity as it related to electric vehicle scale up um, because there was this initial assumption that electric vehicles would be using nickel metal hydride batteries, which have rare earths in them. Uh, but of course, the market's entirely shifted to lithium ion, so that's entirely not a concern anymore, at least as it relates to that industry. Uh, so that, that is an example of, you know, it's even kind of beyond efficiency, just reinventing a new chemistry that does the same thing, different, better, without the impacts, because you're taking out the elements you're concerned about, and it actually can have a substantial difference. And one more, one more information. Uh, lead acid battery recycling is uh, efficient and uh, profitable, but uh, there's so many papers related on the lithium-ion battery recycling. 
uh, in terms of uh, academic papers or something like that. But uh, please forget about those kind of things because uh, recycling of lithium is uh, what they say nonsense uh, co when considering the cost. Uh, there's uh, many experts on the lithium production. We can never compete with that. Uh, the what they say uh, the natural or brine uh, processing compared to the uh, the, the, the recycling. Yeah. Further questions here? Or? <coughs> Thanks, uh, Alex Canara again from. Uh, Thorium Energy Alliance and uh, Citizens for Green Nuclear Power. The um, I think there's a, a way in working with different environmental groups uh, over the years. I think the the concept of recycling and materials use and so forth really deserve a, a rethink because the purpose of recycling is actually not to make money, although. And, and that's where I, I see you recognize that. It's a common good. It's like clean air, clean water, whatever. Because anything that you do that has a market signal in terms of money paid for a battery or whatever else you want to try to recycle, a TV set, uh, that number can change as we know, rapidly, and, and it may have nothing to do with the actual common good for society. So recycling is actually uh, essential. I mean, I just replaced the 50 amp, 220 volt cord for our oven, and your father can have the old one. <laughs> <laughs> you give me his address, I'll send it to him. Right. The point is, the point is that it's not the current market value of the materials that counts. It's what you're achieving for the overall society. And until we recognize that, and you'd be surprised how many environmental groups don't actually understand that reality. And I'm, I'm sorry to say, because they don't, under, they don't make an effort to understand it. They, th they, they look at things from a standpoint of pollution here, waste there, all this this kind of thing, but they don't look at the overall overall reality that this is a common good we're doing. We're, it's like sewer service or water service or you know <laughs> any of the things that we actually really depend upon. It really doesn't matter how much they cost, right? Because we have to have them. Otherwise, we die. We have diseases, just like they just they just uh, killed a few people uh, across the bay the other day with a, a Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> that wasn't properly cooked. I mean, th th this is this gets back to the standards issue, the common good issue, the legislation, and so forth. I think. I think. I think. Um, well, one, recycling is profitable. So I think that's clear. Uh, that's clear. The, the question is, is it cro uh, profitable across the board? No. Um, but we can work. On, you know, governments can work on ways to, to to make it more profitable. Companies can find out new solutions to make something profitable. It's a challenge that needs to be addressed. But everything has a cost. Clean water has a cost. Everything has a cost. So the question is, how do we pay those costs? Do we look for the private sector to find ways and solutions to make money? Because that's definitely sustainable, to use today's words. Or is it for the role of government? Um, and I think there, there, there are steps, and we can look at how each address that. Um, but what I do think is that we can look at ways to recycle, <coughs> reuse things, um, and to make them last, to become more efficient, and set up profitable business models to do that. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point, though, that it, you know, a lot of this does come down to the price that we're willing to pay and how we're trying to shift the burden of those negative externalities um, and internalize it into the price. And I, and I think a great way to do that is with standards. And those can be coming from government or coming from industry and investors. And you know, thinking about it analogous to what we have with the Ford Forest Stewardship Council, FSC certified timber and sustainable timber products, organic certifications. Uh, there's the round table on sustainable palm oil. We have really specific sustainability certification standards. There's no reason we can't do that for rare earths because you know, the fundamental challenge is what was brought up a little bit on the last panel is 
it's not so much that rare earth producers uh, don't want prices to go up. In fact, that, that would be great. And people who are paying for rare earths, as long as everybody else is paying the same price, it's all, it's all about relative prices so that somebody's not, on the one hand, getting forced into more restrictive environmental regulations that do have a price to them while others are basically freeloading and, and doing things in a, a dirty, unsustainable way. So standards are a big way to achieve that. And then standards, because there is a, a price to enforcement, uh, then they elevate the price overall and they make recycling uh, of different types more economically competitive as well. So I, so I think a lot of that, there is a lot of opportunity around standardization, certification for the rare earth supply chain. Because quite frankly, rare earths from a in-consumer product standpoint it's still a very small fraction of the cost. Even for a wind turbine, I tossed out that stat that a typical wind turbine um, can have a ton of neodymium per megawatt of generation capacity. It sounds like a whole lot, but that's still only a few percentage uh, of what the actual turbine sells for on the market. Um, the tiny amount of rare earth that's in that LED display screen I can pretty much guarantee you is also uh, at, at most maybe 1% of the sale price for that thing. Um, and obviously, if we don't have transparency and investors and consumers and governments pushing for standardization around sustainability, there's always going to be this push to the lowest common denominator, lowest common price. But putting in place pretty simple, basic standards would go a long way and not actually translate to particularly higher prices that we're paying on the consumer side. I think, I think when you start to look at prices like that, it, it, it sounds good on the outside, but, but if you're working at a company and your responsibility is to buy X material, and then that material jumps 15 times because you're um, trying to meet some environmental quota, you're gonna have a problem. And it's those people who are making individual decisions along the way um, are the ones that are really, you know, that, that are impacted. Um, and then there are component manufacturers who, while it may be three cents in the total here, it's, it's going to be 40% of what they, uh, what they make. Or if you look at batteries and, and the amount of um, the, the cost of the battery and the production, you're looking at a, a far higher cost of, of material content related to the final cost of the good. So it's somewhere along the, uh, the, on the price, um, somewhere along the supply chain, price does matter to someone. Um, whether it's the end product or the component manufacturer, but someone's affected along the way. But the, the key is everybody needs to be paying the same price, right? Or, or they jump to a different material. So if you, it's not like everyone pays the same price right. because someone may say, all right, well, I found a new, you know, I'm going to jump to something else. And, you know, it, it's, um, it's for, for specific products where there are no substitutes and everyone's playing on a level, level playing field, yes, that, that makes some sense, but, but that's not exactly how it is for all of the products. Let, let me bring in Steve, because your firm is basically making this decision on a day-to-day -day basis, because he told me that about half of their materials are sourced from primary sources, and the other half um, is basically uh, sourced from recycling. So what determines whether you use recycling or you source it from primary sources? Basically price. You know, price for the uh, raw material feed has to be uh, a certain level before scrap is just irrelevant at that point. If it's not a big enough saving for the consumer, they will just use primary metal. So scrap that we are involved in, you know, it needs to be cost effective. It needs to have a, at least a 10, 15 percent saving versus the primary usage of the primary metal. If it doesn't have that, there's, there's very little interest from the uh, consumers to use the product. So recycling, then you can have the product but it's not worth anything, nobody wants it. People will just use the primary metals. And we see that quite a lot. So what makes the scrap, co using the scrap cost effective? Mm -hmm. what, what's the kind of the, 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 uh, the it, it, again, characteristic it's, it's the, of that the, scrap? The, the, the buying formula. You know, each scrap is made up of several different elements. That makes an alloy. Uh, and each alloy, for example, may be purchased at say 65 or 70% 70, 70 of its intrinsics. Uh, and then hopefully sold at 85 or 90 percent of its intrinsics. That little bit in between is processing costs and you know basically business costs, running costs. And if they don't match up, you don't have a recycling business. Mm. So it's very important that uh, 
you know, the recycling uh, pricing purchased is controlled, but it is under extreme pressure when uh, the primary metals are so cheap. Okay. Are there any other questions here? I'm not sure how well you guys can address this because you've been talking about the consumer as other businesses, mostly. Um, I actually try to communicate some of these issues to the consumer level, the actual demand for that iPhone, the actual buyer of that car. And <laughs> clearly, under the guise of this all being green tech, right, there is an awareness in the consumers and has been for the last 50 years with Earth Day that we should be uh, shepherding our resources from Mother Earth. And yet, when you get into these issues of rare earths, they are totally oblivious to the issue. They've never heard of it. They know that they're willing to pay a little bit more for an Apple iPhone because of the, the nifty red. Um, they're willing to pay more for an electric car uh, because they think it's green. But when you start talking about the impact of pollution or the fact that they are consuming uh, possibly uh, some very, some at least now, scarce resources. Um, they are surprised and they ask, what can we do? And my only answer has been, well, don't waste. You know, if you don't need that new iPhone right away, maybe you can wait a second year. You know, at least start looking at those kinds of things, which is a source of recycling, reuse, repurpose, right? It's, it's watching your consumability. But I'm wondering how in this whole discussion, how to start communicating some of these ideas to the end user who's not a physicist, who's not a business person, who's not a chemist, not a geologist, not a geopoliticist. They're just an average consumer of the, the end product. Ian, would you like to respond to that sure, question? Sure, I'll dive in. So one hat I haven't gone into is, is a, a tech company I founded called Oro Eco that basically tracks personal sustainability and gamifies that. So we're communicating with consumers now directly in about 177 countries about personal decision making in terms of sustainability, including electronics purchases, for example. And I, I think, you know, we're already awash with probably too many sustainability certifications, but this is an area where it makes sense to probably have one more, which is some sort of simple sustainably sourced metals label that, that just actually goes on the LED goes on your iPhone, et cetera. And uh, as you mentioned, consumers are already willing to pay a price premium for certified sustainable products, um, organic food being the hugest example now in the US um, and, and increasingly in China as well. And, and I also think it's important not to bash China too much in this whole industry. Um, actually, the Ministry of Environmental Protection in China and in, in 2011 issued a whole lot of regulations. The, the, the question is still how much those are being enforced and what the incentives are. And I think the more the market really demands it, the more enforcement will ramp up. Um, but for one thing is now mining size operations have to be a certain scale to try to have not those illegal small ones, although there's still some out there. There are emission standards around mining um, there are longer holding times now allowed, which allow for a higher percentage of extraction from ore. And there's actually a ban on radioactive monazite um, that's associated with heavier rare earths. Again, enforcement is a major issue, but I think consumers and standardization labeling, that can actually drive a lot of that. I think, oh, go ahead, yeah. Uh, in Japan, uh, Many people, even uh, ordinary people, are very industrial and uh, keen to the recycling. Uh, even though they don't know anything about the uh, pollution when smelting or mining, and they don't know any, what they say, uh, natural, what they say, reserve, or simply because uh, we Japanese has uh, some kind of uh, idea that uh, so-called mottainai, how can I translate it into English, but uh, Mottainai idea is that uh, waste is guilty. And also, uh, people believe Mottainai idea is that uh, if one uh, material is recycled, it will be helpful or it will profit some other else. So I think uh, in this country, also those kind of uh, special, what they say, uh, high rank idea has to be uh, spread or uh, to facilitate uh, what they say, 
uh, recycling, uh, even though the in general recycling is uh, so costly. That is my opinion. So, Sensei, how can I m translate motaina in English? Uh, avoid wasting. So I think this was a very insightful panel. What I take away is that recycling has to become more cost effective so that maybe my kids start collecting gadgets, uh, old gadgets, and, and uh, give it to the recycling process as my father has done when he was young. Um, so let's thank our speakers with a uh, warm round of applause here. Thank you. So let me just uh, share the summary notes that I've made from the wisdom of 25 or so people who are up on the stage and the 100 or so of you who are out there. Uh, the first thing, as that recent movie said, it's complicated. <laughs> and my experience is if something is complicated, you ought to be careful. You should not think that there's some universal solution that you can apply that will solve all of this. The uh, improvement is going to be a case of um, incremental, uh, careful, careful work. No big bang theory here. I think I've also learned that even with the uh, short memory that has been referred to a couple of times of uh, past events, uh, there have been improvements in the system of the resilience of the rare metal supply chain. People are aware of the, aware of the dangers. We've seen several exemplary exemplary uh, companies and government programs which take it into account. So there are some prudent measures that have been taken. Uh, other words to live by, regulation is a blunt instrument, John's uh, contribution earlier, and so be careful of wielding it too, uh, too widely. But with all of that said, I think I get the feeling that there is more that can be and should be done in this area of improving the, uh, improving the resilience of our of our supply chain. And if we can't come up with one universal policy that will solve it all, then maybe just some benchmarks, some guidelines as we go forward might be useful. And these are the ones that, that I would uh, prescribe. I think we all agree that uh, more human bandwidth is needed in this field and that, uh, and that the, um, the loss in the numbers of, uh, of metallurgists and both science and engineers is, uh, is hurting us and there should be, if necessary, artificial measures to just make more capacity available. I think we all agree that uh, more research and development in the area of rare metals, uh, both by companies and by the government, probably splitting the, splitting the roles traditionally with the government funding the earlier stages, the, the lack of uh, the, the types of research and development that may or may not have commercial payoff and with the companies, um, and with the companies uh, also uh, uh, putting in their, uh, in their, in their research budgets uh, work in this area is good. And I think we all agree that uh, we do need better mechanisms for sharing uh, information that the, that the real um, lack of knowledge in the, in the uh, a area, the, the secrets, the, uh, the, the, the just simple um, uh, areas of ignorance uh, are, are hindering good individual decisions and good, good policies. And finally, I think we all, all agree also that uh, cooperation has to be uh, international in this area in order to make improvements. The whole area is so interconnected that, uh, that uh, countries and uh, companies have to work together across national boundaries to be effective. And the in addition to uh, cooperation among the United States and Japan, which is our particular fo focus at Sasakawa USA, uh, we've heard a European dimension to this, and we have, we've had some references to a China dimension, and I uh, fully share the sentiment of most that, uh, that uh, China uh, should be considered as a part of the solution, not simply a rival and part of the, uh, part, part of the problem, that we should try to involve China in improvements in this area, although at the same time, to be prudent, we should not make success of others dependent on whether China provides that uh, solution or not, since it's uncertain as to, uh, as to China's reaction right at the moment. 
And then finally, and this is a good, uh, good solution for an event like this, uh, we need more conferences to, <laughs> to exchange this data and come up with uh, better, better, uh, better data. And out of this conference, we will have a uh, report which we will send around to, uh, to uh, all of you uh, whose emails we have. If we don't have it, please uh, make sure you provide it and we'll, we'll send it on so uh, you can supplement your own personal notes and memories with, uh, with a, a little more complete record. This brings to a close the uh, public part of this uh, program, the part that's being live streamed and will be available uh, on, uh, on certainly our website, and I, I sh I'm assuming uh, Shorenstein's uh, website uh, as well, and, um, and uh, probably make its way onto YouTube. Uh, we, we do have two breakout uh, roundtables that are, uh, will take place over the next uh, hour or so. We originally had, um, had scheduled that, those because uh, we thought that uh, with the public coverage, it might be better to provide sort of a, a uh, more private, off-the-record uh, setting in which we could pursue some of these um, some of these subjects. But they're two very interesting subjects. Let me get my list here so I remember what they are. Led by some members of our group that you've already uh, already seen, but the uh, first. Uh, the first uh, private roundtable will, will be led by uh, Simon Moore uh, on um, technologies of the future, so trying to reach out and, uh, and determine uh, what will be the breakthroughs that will determine the rare metals uh, demand in the future. And uh, the second roundtable, which will be led by Salim Ali, whom you've heard moderating at a, uh, uh, one of our panels already, will be environmental and reputational concerns. We've talked about the environment, we've talked about reputation, and we can talk and we can perhaps uh, talk in a little more detail about those then. Uh, some of you have signed up for some of these roundtables, but uh, I've checked and there, there is a space, so if you would uh, like to join, join uh, one of them, uh, please, please do. I think they're on the third deck, uh, two, two decks up from here, uh, one in the Philippines room, one in the uh, Okimoto room. Uh, they are running simultaneously, so you're going to have to choose one or the, uh, whether the one or the other for the, the next hour. And then uh, for those of you who are coming back, uh, coming back uh, tomorrow, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, four more private round tables that will be run uh, two, two at a time. So there's a, a chance for some more subjects and those topics are in your, in your, uh, in, in your handouts. So again, uh, thanks to uh, all of you for persisting here to the, uh, to the end of this very in interesting day. And certainly a thanks to uh, all of the organizers uh, and the, the panelists and participants here. Thanks, thanks to all of you.